when, when, when the reviews first started being published for this, for this book, I decided to stop reading book reviews because if there's one thing worse than a bad review of a DBC Pierre book, it's a good review <laughs> because it's, it's basically someone trying to understand the incomprehensible and this is always a bad idea. Thought three, um, does DBC's life work follow life or, or does life follow DBC's writing? This is what he was putting onto his notebook page or laptop while we were all waiting for COVID to happen. Casualty departments across the country have reported a surge in pediatric cases following the recent viral phenomenon vanilla lipo, also known as kitty tongue lipo or cookie dough lipo, depending on the method used. Health authorities report that more than a dozen children have so far been hospitalized and dozens more checked after using vacuum cleaners to try to shift subcutaneous fat. And so on it goes. We go into a sort of medical dystopia um, into which we are all about to go and from which we have not... A medical learned. dystopia. Um, you didn't expect that. Did... Uh, we can talk about Uvalde or we cannot talk about Uvalde, depending on whether he wants to. But this... It's tragic. Sorry. Yeah, that's tragic. This is about Uvalde. Yeah. Um, this was written after, after the first an extremely unusual high school shooting incident in about 1988, 1999. Um, and the only thing that was clear at that time was that the, the noise we made about it guaranteed that it would continue to happen. So we created the format uh, via the news. Um, and sadly, it, it's continued to happen. and. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary. It took this long for it to get to, techni to Texas itself, but... Um, it, you know, was it Columbine that, that inspired it? Was, yeah, I think what actually triggered it, this was triggered by uh, a slightly earlier one, which was um, Kip Kinkle in Oregon. And this was a lad who had some mental health issues, but was given a lot of guns for his birthday. And he used them first to kill both his parents and then to go to school and take out some schoolmates. Um, and he he's currently is still serving time for that and will probably serve the rest of his life. But I think that was the trigger and it was simply because I'd seen underneath these horrible stories, you still have to go, what is in the shooter's mind? And Kip Kinkle, I think, couldn't have been more than about 14 and he, you know, 14 is a horrible age no matter what uh, you're doing, or it can be. Um, and I just saw the whole book was inspired by uh, the television image of just this dork adolescence with his hoodie, round shoulder, um, surrounded by seemingly dozens of police cars and lights and officers, and he's being put into a police car. And I didn't hear the soundtrack on the news, but just that picture told me what had happened, that he'd done something so, so profane. This was the response. And, uh, and as that happened, I thought, A, how, really how responsible is he at 14? That's a very unusual time of life for all of us. And it was first, his, his voice was what kicked this book off, or me imagining his voice and who that was. And I got a little way into the book and found that I could no longer write with him as the shooter because I couldn't, in the end, sympathize in any way, no matter what burdens he was carrying. And so the character of Vernon came out, who was blamed for it but wasn't guilty. It was the only way I could get through writing the rest of the book. And uh, sadly, it has become a format. By May this year, the United States was up to 220 mass shootings. So that has just exponentially grown and grown. And uh, it's tragic. I hadn't, at the time, this was, you know, art. Of course, art is what we use for, the, for psychology to, to work through these things. And at the time, it was just that kind of response. And now it's, uh, I think, too late to even go there.
You suggested that somehow the the reaction to these events creates the next it one. It does, and it's and, known you know, which to. Which is the cart, which is the horse. Yeah, yeah and, no, and, it's absolutely known to. Um, and this is well studied now by neuroscience. And every time this happens, you'll see neuropsychologists around the country will be going, where's the next one going to be? And there will be, and there will be some fantastic... Uh, numbers neuroscience has come a long way in the last 10 15 years and they've discovered for instance for sure that if there is a high profile suicide in the media the suicide rate grows a thousand percent in the area where that media appeared and the way they could show that it was a result of the news story was that if it were a murder suicide, then the suicides that grew were double and triple suicides, or they were murder suicides. If it was an individual, then only the individual suicides grew. And it stretched to this really alarming phenomena that um, car accidents and aircraft crashes also rose by about a thousand percent in the week or so following that news. And exactly the same thing applied. If it were an individual suicide, it would be an individual in a car or an aeroplane. If it were a murder suicide, there would be passengers also going with them. And it's just, they've discovered the license. There's, there's a license function in the brain. And uh, it's the reason that we follow others. I guess it's a, a survival mechanism that makes us follow each other and, and to stay safe, but of course that license works, works uh, two ways. And so if we're on the edge of something big, just even that license of someone else doing it will cause the next one and the next one. And it's, uh, we live in incredibly delicate times, I find. Uh, causation, or the unpredictability of causation, is the core of this. And yes. I think that we've got, over the next, because um, there will be more Quest, you, you will have more. You will have more interesting questions than I will, and so we're going to make sure that there's plenty of time for them. But, but as I see it, we're kind of our, our brief and the books themselves uh, oblige us to talk about kind of everything and nothing really. So it's a bit like jazz, um, which is also a, a, has its own strange causation. We're going to just try and find a key and see what happens. Yeah. Um, having. I rather dreaded getting Uvalde out of the way. Now maybe we sort of have. But yeah, we, have, but we haven't really because of what you just said. Our heart bleeds. Um, it's ridiculous. But, the, but there are two things that um, I'd love to, you know, sort of focus on, with your kind permission, all of you. Uh, and they are loosely speaking God and Mexico, and they're not unrelated. We live in a strange world now, um, in which. Spirituality is rather like the Victorian view of sex. You know, everybody does it, or 90% of the poor world does it, but journalists and editors sort of pretend they don't. This is a difficult conversation to have in Ireland, where obviously the, the sort of well, the, the, the conquest of the Catholic Church is, is, is part of a liberation of sorts. But um, when um, uh, this book sets out on uh, examining, quotes, the ballistic chaos of maths outside the window and a whole climate of life which resists calculation on paper. And we're invited to, to join a specific mission to look at that space between odds and their outcome. Now, you, you've already kicked off with suicides and, uh, and imitative shootings and so on. But, but what actually, what, what door are you opening here and and um, what what can we expect to come through it? Well, you know, it, it's good you've, you've you've brought it right to the point. Um, and this wasn't a thought that I formed writing the book, but it is the God door. In this respect, the the book sets out for us to ask: first of all, are we following the right clues? We had a chat yesterday about. Uh, statistics and how actually there's there's a tyranny of science going on at the moment. I love science and agree with it and we're progressing in many important ways but socially it's become a very tyrannical force now where if the numbers don't add up it, it kind of doesn't exist. Unless we can reproduce it in a laboratory it doesn't really exist 
And of course, our lives are made of much weirder material than that. We live through many one-off experiences and many coincidences, uh, and they can't be explained in a lab except by mathematics. And the book ends up, I think, opening the God door, which for me is the same thing. I don't, I'm not a, a traditionally religious person, um, but I agree with belief, and I believe belief is powerful and does change lives and does move things in the material world. Um, the book puts it at the, at the door of mathematics to say that, of course, all occurrences, uh, normal and outrageous, are a mathematical probability. But that doesn't disagree with God at all in the sense that I'm quite happy to say believing in God as a being admits, of course, that if everything flows from him, then so does mathematics and so do all the fortune we're talking about. Um, and the mathematics itself, if we're, if we're agnostic or atheistic, the mathematics still exists and is doing exactly the same thing. And I think we appeal to it. We spent for many thousands of years appealing to a higher power, sometimes with uh, some amazing results. And now we're doing exactly the same thing with science, sometimes with some amazing results. Remember that a few years back, the head of uh, one of the really big pharmaceutical companies admitted uh, kind of in error that only 30% of drugs work as they should on about 30% of people. And it, it's actually in one of these books. I think, for me, that's about the mean average of success for everything in the human world. <laughs> <laughs> and if you think about it, it's true. You know, look, we hire governments, we hire companies, all the stuff that we do. The truth is most of the success concentrates in that little 30%. And we have mechanisms in our mind to say, well, the rest of it was a rat fuck, but, but we got this result out of it. Um, and that is exactly what we've been doing, whether we're, whether we're beseeching or trying to recreate something in a lab. I think it is the same thing, and I'm happy, happy to call it God, frankly. And that brings Mexico in, because they've, they're happy to worship anything, uh, God and their own local spirits and powers. You've been drawn here under the title The Allure of Danger. The Allure of Risk. Risk, sorry, risk. And in a way, I mean, in, Re in Mexico, there are, there are all the obvious risks, um, but there is a deeper risk, is there not? I mean, you never quite know where the edge or the bottom is in Mexico. Um, I, I have a tattoo, which I shan't show you now. It's great. I can see part but, of it down here. It's, this it's, is beautiful. It's, it, it's got the Virgin of Guadalupe there. Ah, mira. But she's got a snake <laughs> crawling around. Mira, cabrones. Ah. OK, it's, it's a Boris moment. <laughs> yeah, you ready with this, guys? Keep your trousers on, decent. Here we go. Whoa, that's pretty good. There she is. La Guadalupe. Madre mía. La Virgen de Guadalupe. But the problem is that mine's got a serpent crawling around her waist and slightly around her thighs. So when if I have a tank top or I'm on a beach, good Catholics go, ma que bella es la Guadalupe. Then they say, Serpiente! Que horror! Porque hay <laughs> the heresy. Why is the virgin got a snake crying? The snake's biblical. But, exactly. And but the campesinos get it straight away. Yeah. Ah, es cuatlique. Because if you've seen the wonderful film that sí. uh, DVC made about the Aztec, Cuatlique is the goddess of fertility and destruction, which translates rather conveniently as womb and tomb. <laughs> and so basically it, it there's this wonderful word, syncretismo. Sí. And when you say you can believe anything, you can, because you can. it's all sort of, not for nothing is Lazaro, a popular name in the Caribbean and on the Gulf Coast, because the Jesuits came and told the story of St. Lazarus ring raisin for the dead. It was like, yeah, you're trying to, something I don't know, eh, hey, claro que si, he's a zombie. Um, yeah. and, and the resurrection <laughs> is go, whoa, here he comes. Um, but see, it doesn't but, disagree. So can you talk a bit about that kind of, that? that Mexican sort of element. Uh, uh, there's a marvelous bit in here where uh, Mexico here is a, is a liberation. Yeah. Vernon craves to go to Mexico. 
the, the, the sort of, as it were, the kind of the almost honeymoon at the end is, is to Mexico. Yeah, Talk yeah. about Mexico and your film, the Aztec, you and, and the bottomless Mexico. Mexico, well, yeah, starting, starting with God. And these, these various beliefs, of course, the Mexicans by, by instinct know that it kind of doesn't matter what you worship. If it's all created by God, then that is still godly. So they don't have a problem with where the higher power is. It's all encompassing, etc. Mexico is what gave me all of this uh, madness. And it's because I was there when I was seven, and I grew up there until it was my home until I was 25. Uh, the laws of physics and life are very different there. And this book, Big Snake, Little Snake, talks about that how some places and some times just have different odds. And you can feel it, coincidences happen differently and more frequently, and you can feel it. And in Mexico City, uh, you have right up the top of a mountain range, 8,000 feet above sea level, there's a valley, a basin, surrounded by 11 volcanoes, and inside that is Mexico City, the capital. The valley of Mexico now holds about 30 million plus people, Due to its altitude, of course, the laws of physics are different. Water boils at a much lower temperature, so your cups of tea can be shit. And <laughs> the, you weigh less in case you're on a, a diet. Um, so there are literally laws of physics going, if you stay there for a few weeks, you develop many more red blood cells and you get uh, much more oxygen carrying capacity, which is why athletes will go there to train for the Olympics because they come back to sea level and they're like supermen, they've got extra, extra oxygen capacity. So there are genuinely different laws of science up there, but on top of that is this incredible volcanic, mystical place, the electrical storms, low, low electrical storms will come in and just brew up out of nowhere and thunder and lightning. And at the same time, the city is built layer upon layer of ancient pyramids and, and conquest and it used to be a lake they've drained the lake and now the city sits on a lake bed which means parts of it are sinking every year back into the lake and it's just a, a completely abnormal situation and the way life works there you can imagine it's not Mexico is about the 12th largest economy in the world so an important country very civilized place extremely faithful people people of strong belief, very polite city, and it works very, very well. And it's, I guess, because that many people have to get along together, and they do, but they do have uh, many, many different things to believe in, many gods and saints and, and mythologies. And luck works differently, I swear. You can feel it in the air, your odds are different. It occurs uh, to me that the only European city that's comparable to that is Napoli. You were just saying, and, yeah. Um, uh, you know, where people interpret dreams through numbers um, and so on. And it just occurred to me when uh, look, looking at, at, at the, uh, as it were, the, 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 the lottery game. Yeah. In Naples, they have a thing called the Smorfia, which is exactly the same. I mean, body parts, symbols for numbers and so on. But Naples is built under a volcano and on a fault line. Yeah. Electrical so power. Are we, are we finding something here? I don't know. Maybe not. It could be. But there is a lot of power there. And if you look at... I mean, this is very relevant here because the reason I feel extremely at home in Ireland is I get the same sense. And it's not necessarily the landscape, but travelling through the people. And there's, there's something extremely special there. The luck of the Irish is a much deeper statement than people think. Uh, a willingness, a willingness to live and let live, and a willingness to live well, uh, and to not sweat the small stuff, uh, is very important. And they have that too. And I, you know, it does make you wonder how much faith and how much group faith has to do with that. A common, a common belief. Belief's very powerful, and people together are very powerful. And we do have electrical frequencies. And it is known through a number of experiments that put in a room together, we can influence each other without speaking or looking. Uh, people can 
feel the positives and negatives, and so we're, we're very sensitive creatures. Big Snake, Little Snake proposes that we've forgotten that we used to be much more in tune and intuitive, and hence we used to live much more naturally, and we've kind of forgotten that because WhatsApp is easier. How do you think that happened? Eh? How do you think? How, how think, and when I, do you think it happened? I mean, I think, are you talking about a pagan island pre-Christian that's kind no, of I'm finding just, itself again, or are you talking? I'm about, talking about the market, right? I think I'm talking about the market. We used to do things the hard way, and we used to have to rely on each other much more. We were less affluent. I mean, we speak of, you know, God knows there are different ways to look at poverty, but we speak of poverty in our own cultures, in in Britain and Ireland and these places, and you go really, it's not. You know, it's not poverty as it has been. This is still relatively affluent. You'd be very unlucky to to die in our countries now from hunger and etc. Something else would have to happen as well. Um, and I think since the the industrial revolution, the market has slowly been going. We'll do that for you. And uh, here's something you can use for that. Here's something you can use for that. And so now we have all our remedies are external and paid for, and they run the economy. And as soon as, as soon as we feel uh, a flutter of anxiety, we can buy the next thing and buy the next thing, whereas we used to have other things, including prayers and different things that we would do. Now about the best thing we can hope for is that our fitness watch registers panic attacks as exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I think in a way with the sort of, um, you know, my generation of Greece only was, you know, hugely affected by Marxism. Uh, mine um, too. Well, Mexico was the, the strong leftist, yeah, yeah. but it was cappuccino but leftist. They would grow the Che Guevara beard and that. But it also it. had, had, you know, the, the, the Guadalupe, the, the belief factor. My mother passed away in February, and while she was uh, dying, um, I went out with one of my impeccably Marxist Catalan friends, and I sort of just, you know, we would, uh, she sort of, despises any kind of spirituality and I sort of you know you cut yourself off from a, a lot of the world with this you know it's atheism was invented by kind of white people for white people really and you know she said no I'm with Nietzsche you know God is dead so well I said, I said I'm with God you know Nietzsche's dead or maybe not <laughs> but then, then no but sorry to Nietzsche is sounded dead, like yeah. a stuck record but I said try to, to I said but you're Spanish and we have a mutual friend called Lydia Cacho who's a great Mexican journalist and I said I said um you know try convincing Lydia Try convincing a Mexican. Anyway, my mother died on a Friday night. On a Saturday morning, I got a text from Lydia saying, uh, Hola, Ed, how is your mum? I had a dream about her last night. Ah, uh, Mira. I called her up. I said, Lydia, what do you know? Ah, hola, eh, como estáis? Uh, como esta, uh, como es tu mamá? Lydia, she died last night. Yeah. What, what was your dream? Oh, your your mama came into my bedroom and sat on my bed and said, "Tell Ed not to go back to Mexico." <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh no! But but anyway, sorry, I'm I'm getting back to something you've already dealt with. But we didn't quite get there. No, we didn't. When you say it's a place of belief, what are you saying? In, in, Do you know what the what actually does that mean? Like, how does it affect daily life? How how does it affect this? Belief. Uh, if we chase it all the way to the end, it's. Uh, I'm afraid all we do uh, with any of these tools is hedge against death. That's the only one thing we disagree with uh, as soon as we're born. And um, I'm convinced that pretty much everything we do is uh, a, a, a down payment on some kind of immortality. And the book does actually bring up against certain current current mainstream uh, theories of physics by which it's not possible to die. And that's very interesting. That is in this century now um, where the mass of how the universe might work is starting to suggest actually that this, is, this also fits. And after so many thousands of years, first of all, we're born enabled to conceive of death and that is quite interesting we can conceive of everything but there is no way for us to imagine our own oblivion we we see it apparently in others but but we cannot put ourselves there and that's kind of unusual then we spent thousands of years spontaneously intuitively 
clustering around beliefs in a being or a place where we continue to live after this life. And now, very curiously, uh, people like uh, Hugh Everett III in particular, the many worlds theory has it that everything we do splits into a universe of its own. We live in many universes, but because it does that, we cannot die in theory as one of those universes will always result in our survival. And so we travel like this uh, forever. And it's a very, very interesting moment in science, but I hadn't thought about that specifically until, until you brought it up. But of course, all of our beliefs and stuff at the end, we want to be lucky today. We want to buy a beer, win this lottery and do these different things and be healthy and have our family and etc. But really, you know, if you gave us one wish, we'd want to stick around. And, um, and that's the one thing that's been denied us except through God and now potentially suddenly through uh, certain theories of science. Which brings us to two sort of, well, one philosophical issue and one, one sort of teleological. Where does free, you know, free will versus determination? I Here mean, this comes is, the big this, tech story. This has <clears throat> obsessed philosophers since they started yeah. thinking. Um, do, you know, according to these extraordinary sort of um, mathematical spiritualistic constructions or deconstructions that you come up with in this collection of work. Um, do we have any free, do we have any agency at all? That's the first kind of existentialist question to ask you. And then there's the other one, because you have been promised that we'll talk about technology as well, which is not, I mean, I don't know anything about it, so I can ask it, about it. It feeds into that question well, exactly. And it's here. It's progress. You, you, you use the term somewhere, uh, the, 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 the lie of progress or the... Uh, um, I can't actually remember what... I've got so many... I think it could be the lie of progress. I think, I think it's the vague lie of progress. So, you know, two of these, these things that we really sort of want to cling to, some sense of agency, which your, which your snake, you know, might uh, dispute, and some idea of progress that sort of somehow, which always struck me as a rather weird idea, that why should Tuesday by definition be better than Monday? Yeah. yeah. Um, when it's clearly all going to hell with regard to climate, our relationship with, to nature and so on. Where, where do these two concepts that people, you know, are fond of fit into your, your, your view of these universes that might or might not survive? Where, can we control anything? Well, I mean, theoretically, I do believe in free will. Uh, of course, this will lead in just now to the, the big tech conversation. But uh, I believe in free will. Of course, for centuries, there have been two strands of thought in philosophy. One saying that we, we behave completely automatically uh, and are simply gifted with a sense of free will, which is bullshit. And the other one saying that, no, in fact, we do new things. Here's the key, the test of free will is creating new information. Do new things get created? And on the one side they say, well, no, all you're doing is creating new versions of old existing stuff. Uh, I argue that we do absolutely create new things and new information and hence we have free will. Um, but the danger we're facing, and this is, in, in my view, the most extreme danger for the species is that unbeknownst to just about everyone the current gods the high priesthood of social media in the person of your google founders your facebook founders and etc have lucked into a tremendous gold mine which is uh, human behavior and are harvesting, unbeknownst to everyone. I mean, we think we're ticking boxes and agreeing to contract. There's another layer beneath that, a shadow profile, which is recording not only what you're saying about your friends, what your friends are saying about you, who you're looking at, the pictures you're looking at, what pictures the people in those pictures are looking at. They're building a mechanism 
and it's completely on the basis of uh, deterministic philosophy, on the basis that we are automatic creatures and can and should be controlled. And there are even uh, quite famous philosophies stating we should be controlled. And these are utopian ideas where actually we're wayward. Look at Uvalde, look at these things. They will use that as evidence that actually we shouldn't be trusted with our free will. What we need now is for all that behavior to be understood by supercomputers and for us to be manipulated into the world that's best for us. Uh, of course, what's happening is we're being manipulated into the world that's best for Mark Zuckerberg and the rest of us are getting shot By popular butt. demand, that's the point. Well, I the mean, point is we um, rushed you know, it, we're not, there's, if no, we knew, there's no great revolution against this. No, but here's the thing. We don't need to be raped to use the product. Those products will work without them taking all our data. It doesn't need the algorithm. It needs it for profit, but not to work. And so, of course, we're rushing to the idea. If we honestly knew the depth and level to which they're manipulating stuff, it's extraordinary. I mean, we're living, think about it, a lot of money they're spending as well on simply making us believe that this is inevitable and that it's good. They literally have hired consultants and media mm. people and lobbyists in government just to make us feel that this is the way things should go. Think about this. Uh, Facebook has boasted that it can find teenagers when they're feeling depressed, low, low self-esteem, and it sells them to clients on that basis when they're feeling low. So it can pick up people who are vulnerable and sell them on. At the same time as our countries are living through what we would say uh, crises, childhood crises with anxiety and mm -hmm. depression, for the first time, certainly in, in my lifetime, no one is putting those two things together. This news appeared, that's a known issue with Facebook, and it's a known issue that we have a teen crisis. There is no power going, well, hang on, that's causing that. Well, progress is hard to fit into that. I mean, apart from, <clears throat> you know, the obvious and greatest, Samuel Beckett, for whom the idea of progress is just a laughable absurdity, there are two kind of pre-digital... Um, nails in the coffin of the idea of progress and it was always that competition you know which is worse 1984 or brave new world yeah. you know happy <laughs> happy dippy happy everybody or the jackboot um i mean this is worse than both have a listen Good. for a moment please a new mental health app claims to be able to increase mental wellness and remove personal obstacles by hosting final conversations with the dead Designed on the back of research showing that a failure to clear the air before a loved one dies can be a leading contributor to breakdowns later in life. The app is designed to listen to and answer users' concerns via one of 16 profiles programmed with strong AI to match deceased loved ones' personalities. The living can also store profiles for use in conversations after their death. Some early users are calling the experience uncanny with eerily accurate feedback. Well, George Orwell and Huxley would both have trouble. We're going uh, there. We're going there. Um, it's the scariest thing I, I've ever seen, for sure. And, of course, we're marching into it. it it's next level. All we can hope, and I still have this, this hope, and actually a, a small belief that uh, we are actually wayward and weird enough and we do create enough new information that, by nature, we will end up foiling the system because it's... Uh, it's working on the basis that we are 100% predictable. And when has that ever been the case? So there is, there is a, small, uh, a small out. On that note, I think we've got time for... Is anyone in charge? Or I, I couldn't right, be in charge out of a, time of a paper warm. bag. So, I mean, I'm, gonna, we, I'm just going to keep rolling until One we get a One question about snakes. <laughs> Let's have... Uh, we, I think we've got 10 minutes, so... Um... Uh, would you let Alexa into your home? No. Alexa records everything, runs it through a psychological analysis and sells that information to companies and you are not allowed by law to, to have that information. People think Alexa only comes on when you speak to it. No, 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 it will record your children. It will record you having sex. It will run that through a program 
to discover. If you have a fitness or a sleep watch, that information is sold. If you buy a car now with Wi-Fi connection and stuff, the information of your driving and what you say and do is sold. And your insurance premium, you will find, will go up and down according to how you drive the car. So, no, this is control. I wouldn't get anywhere near it. And put it that the phone in my pocket is doing it anyway, of course. But it goes deeper and deeper than that, even. Hi, I have the misfortune or otherwise to have worked as a researcher in close proximity to some of those technologies. And to cut a long story short, I ran screaming in 2017. Um, it's all Thank true. Thank you. I know more than I would ever care to know. Um, turn it off. Ditch it. Did you ever wonder why Facebook... I now find myself, Facebook is sending me ads about things I haven't even uttered out loud. I was involved in emotion recognition research using predictive analysis, and I've no idea if it came from elsewhere, but I sometimes feel like Einstein must have felt when they took his lovely technology and built an atomic bomb. And the problem is that it's all built on a model of selling you things. It is not tech for good. And there is a glimmer of hope. I still haven't closed down my Facebook account because I figure it might come handy if I ever want to sue them. And um, you're perfectly correct about them doing completely unauthorized psychological research in a large cohort of teenagers without any ethics clearance whatsoever. They're still at it. Um, the game is you and your money. Um, it is not tech for good, and the only good thing I can say, the glimmer of hope, is I have two children, one of whom is 22, has just finished psychology, the other is 20. Neither of them use Facebook, and neither do their friends. Fantastic. So there is actually light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, kids but are getting smarter than what, what you than we sign up for them. now, when you sign up for a social media app, one of the boxes you tick, and I possibly also on your phone contract, is that you allow them to use on device information. Your own device information can include your heartbeat, your facial expressions, your gait, um, the speed at which you're working, the numbers, there, everything. It's so wholly intrusive that it couldn't be any more so. And as for the mental health apps, and I have very direct experience of those, that you could only acquire enough knowledge to actually intervene, and this is what my research was about essentially, with, you could not acquire it without wholesale intrusion. Thank you, ma'am. Thank yeah. you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Except, of course... And God if, bless your children. If, if it plugged into DBCs, it'd probably short-circuit the system. Thank you very much indeed. Have, I think we've got time for a question. Have we? Yes, please. I, I don't know who's in charge, and if it's me, that's, that's unthinkable. So. Um, <laughs> that's unthinkable. One of our ministers has proposed bringing in uh, facial recognition so that it would help the guards um, identify criminals faster. To me, that sounds like the introduction of police state. It, it has shades of what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs. Yeah. Um, have you any suggestions or how we can combat that? Well, we don't need to talk about China, actually. We, we, we love our Chinese mates, but it's, that's, of course, particularly scary. Especially, currently, facial recognition is still relatively crap, and so it does get it wrong. A percentage of time which uh, which shouldn't be allowed. I think we need to sell recreational uh, bunny rabbit masks, and and all of us go out in those, and see if they legislate against bunny rabbit masks. And this is a question now of flushing the government the government's intentions out. But all of this is being done on the basis of that one. Ex it's still a great exception to a rule that someone will be a criminal in a in a group of people. Um, the fact that the entire society should pay for that one exception is is the point here, and uh, I don't buy it whatsoever. No, I would fight, I would fight tooth and nail against that. We have to be very careful. Things are headed that way. That these are not good times for democracy, and they're not good times for freedom. We have much less. Anyone who's who's even over thirty, I would say, will know that they had much more freedom in the world as children than they do today and we will have less tomorrow and less after that so um you know we need we need to keep it in mind and 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 make sure we keep our elbow room we're still at the lucky end of the world in terms of that the other countries have gone and we've, we've watched them fold one by one where they've had that one election with an autocrat who's asked the question do you love ice cream and should we just abolish elections for a while or do you hate your family? 
and shall we continue having elections? And and they've gone, no, we love ice cream. And so plenty of countries now have just got presidents for life. And uh, even parts of the English speaking world are starting to like that idea as well. Uh, you know, these are going to be, this is going to be a hairy ride, I say, the next few years. So it's up to us to uh, keep some elbow space and uh, keep the love. Absol that's one of the things that I think sort of, you know, is is even less realised in the infuriating good reviews of your book than it is in the infuriating not so good ones. I mean, is your there's a sort of basic humanism running all this through all this. I mean, Lon is a, we have a choice of love or fear, a, one, yeah. and in and, everything we do, choose love. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, DBCPF. <laughs> Thank you. Salud. Thanks, just, my man. Just one little round. He's got a postscript for you. Yeah. Ed's where's, got a postscript. Where's the bit about, I may not find it in time. It's weakness. It's that little bit on weakness. Yeah. Everybody wants to be strong and tough, don't they? But actually, this is, this is his great challenge. Little coda here. Look at your life. See honestly how much of it derives from compulsion, wrong thinking, and weakness, and how much from purpose and strength. Put aside the compensating systems that balance things up so we can even drag ourselves out of bed in the morning and look. Unwanted pregnancy, failed relationship, debt crisis, family feud, grinding job, dangerous romance, all the things we can rationalize as part of life's rich tapestry and edit to seem like purposeful strides. But one day, look at it, really. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.